Okay, so Frank started this, uh, this lesson for Tulip oh, six or so weeks ago. So as always, I'm not Frank, I need your help. So participation is necessary to keep me from saying something stupid or falling down. <laughs> so, all right, so who can tell me what T and Tulip represents? All right, I love how y'all say that with that kind of sadness, total depravity. It is a sad concept, but it's a truthful concept. We are all captured by total depravity. Does that mean we're as bad as we could be? No. What does it mean? It means we're all fallen in sin. Every one of us, every atom in our bodies, every part of our body is, con is contaminated by the sin that we have within us. That's the part of total depravity. What about unconditional election? Who can give me a quick definition of that? The Lord saw that in the future, so many people will be so ah, Frank has let you down because <laughs> he taught that lesson. He has let you down so bad. Can you give us a correct answer for that one? Nothing that we do will bring us to God and never God. That's right. I love the example of the potter and the clay. If we are dead in our sins, as Scripture tells us, then we have no ability to choose, not choose, to change the choice of God. Unconditional election means God so chose those whom He chose, which we're also going to talk about in every element, every letter of Tulip. So that's His choice, purely. Now, L, limited atonement. Juan, you can't answer, man, after that one. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Limited atonement. Who can give me a definition of limited atonement that we can work with today? Terry? I think you want to speak, man. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. That's the work of, uh, of, uh, of the Holy Spirit makes application of the work of Christ to all those who God chose before the foundation of the world. Beautiful. Now, what's the limited part? Does that mean it's insufficient in any so way? Gotcha. That's it. It's not limited in its ability to remove all stains of sin. It's limited in that only those whom God chose, go back to the U, can then have the T wiped away because of the L. The limited atonement says that uh, the cross of Christ was sufficient for all sins, but it's applied to those sins from the elect, from the chosen. Then last week, I looked back in Irresistible Grace and I failed to uh, point out so many things, it's crazy. But there's one or two I want to touch back on. Now, if you remember the criticism we started off with, I think Steve Chong might have mentioned it. Um, was that the irresistible part. Some people trip on irresistible. So the question is, does that mean that God pushes some people to hell and then also drags others kicking and screaming into heaven? What a crazy image that would be anyway, right? Who would say, oh, I don't want what this is the very best possible thing for me. I don't want that. That's the image it presents to us, which can't possibly be. However, the kicking and screaming image, Acts 9, let me see if I can pull that up real quick and read it for you. just want to clarify a point from last week. So again, the criticism was fighting against the Spirit, right? And resisting the irresistible grace. Let me read from Acts 9. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? All right, that's the image of kicking and screaming, right? Paul beforehand was the opposite of what he is after. He was Saul, right? Saul was, as we know, fighting against the Holy Spirit. He was fighting against the Christian church. He was fighting against the way. He was persecuting, he was imprisoning, and he was even there for the stoning of Stephen. So when we read these words, and I chose this translation on purpose, it's not the translation I prefer, but the kicking against the goads, there's, that's what happens. By the way, what's a, what is a goad? I stick with a thing that you used to go cattle. I didn't know you were a farmer, man. That's awesome. You nailed it. 100 years. <laughs> oh, man. So a, a goad, which I had to look up because I, I knew it was related to that, but I didn't know exactly what it was. Yeah, it's a stick. It's basically a prod. So if you're imagining um, this image that is used by the words we've just read, we have someone who is resisting, who is not saved, who is fighting against the goads. And the goad, if you're imagining this stick just poking 
the oxen, which is typ typically used, uh, pushing the oxen to follow a path that's intended to, hmm, does that help us understand irresistible grace? It does me, because I'm a lot like that ox, right? Mm -hmm. Pig-headed, stubborn, bullish. I choose wrong more than I choose right on my own, but yet the Lord is there. It's irresistible grace helping me to understand, putting people in our paths that help us understand Scripture far better than we would on our own. And then here is this image of Paul, Saul becoming Paul at this instant. And when the Lord appears to him and tells him about how he's kicking against the goads, what is his immediate response? Tell me what I need to do, right? He's not fighting against heaven. He was fighting against his wrong perceptions. And it's a beautiful image. So there is that kicking against the goads and fighting and screaming and being forced into heaven. You can see it that way, but that's definitely not how it's presented in Scripture. So that was I. Now today we're going to talk about perseverance of the saints, which is, um, we touched on a little bit last week, um, the illusion or the illustration we're going to use today. In your handouts, we, I'm actually going to try my best to actually go by the people we passed out. There's no cartoons, unlike last week. I'm sorry if you missed those. All the cartoons were last week. Um, so we're just going to go straight through what we have here. Perseverance of the saints. We're going to use the Westminster Confession of Faith and the parable of the prodigal. So we're going to start off by reading this first section. Luke 15, 11 through 16. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. There he squandered his property in reckless living, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out as a, uh, to one of the citizens of the country, who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So we're going to walk through this parable, looking to see how we can better understand perseverance of the saints. And for that reason, all of Tulip. Now, here we have a longing father, a loving father, a straying son, and a son who wants to stay. What is the interest of the young man's pursuits? What is he interested in? Self-gratification. Self-gratification. Perfect. What is shown by the way the son words his request to the father? Is he wording it as a request? I didn't see a question mark there. It's a demand. Who said that? Demand. That's right. That is spot on. He's not asking. He is telling the Father, give me what I have coming. And that this is coming, uh, that is coming to me, presumptuous and unearned, right? Because what has he done? What has he done other than live under his Father's roof, share in the Father's protection, eat at the Father's table? It tells us he's done nothing. So that's important for us to remember. By the way, what do we do for our own salvation, right? All about the same. Does the Father stop the younger son from departing? That's a great question. Could he have? Did he have to give the son anything? It, today, in our culture, if the son approached a parent with this, would the son be would the parent be obligated to give the son anything? No, absolutely not. In that culture, it was even more so. And uh, I've heard it said, and for whatever it says, that request that he is making is essentially requesting his inheritance before his father is dead. And that's important for us to remember. It's essentially wishing or telling the Father that to me you're as good as dead because you have nothing else to offer me other than the possessions that you are then, I am then asking and that you would then be giving me. So that's an affront. And if you know your Old Testament scripture, you know when a child has disrespected the father or the parents to that degree, what could happen to them? What could the parents do? Hmm? Yeah. He could kill them. He could have the son put to death for the disrespect that he has just done. But that's not at all what has happened, is it? By the way, we see in this also, when we, we talked about before the concept of free will. This is the son choosing, right? This is free will. He's choosing between bad and bad, right? He's choosing what comes natural to his heart, which is choosing his own destruction. What else do we see? And uh, the father definitely has the power of the property, and he has the power of the son, and yet he allows it. Okay, so if this image is the father in here is God the Father, and, he, and this father is allowing the younger son to choose sin and then to go out and live and suffer from sin. Does that have any application to our understanding of free will? I have put forward to you that it absolutely does. That's how we live as well. 
next section. Is there consideration for parents to be found here? And this is kind of a side issue, but it's worth pointing out. Not all believers have children who believe. In this parable, do we read anything about the poor parenting of the father? No. Is it the father's failure that the son chooses to sin? No. Is it the um, father's res um, responsibility that the son chooses to sin? Is it the father's failure? Is it his anything that is the father's here? By the way, remember, the father represents God. So we have to take care. No. Yes, sir. Exactly. Absolutely. That's a beautiful point, too. It really is. What else do we have? The father, does the father stop loving the son? Does the father um, approach his response in a way that's hurtful or harming or tell him what he could do and still allows it? No. All you. That's it, yeah. All you see here is love from the Father. So as a parent, and we are, those of us who are here who are parents, and those of us who know others who have had children that stray, it is encouraging to know that this beautiful parable from God's own hand tells us of a father whose son did not follow immediately the path, right? That he actually strayed. So that's encouraging. Whitney, you're going to read this uh, Westminster Confession blurb for me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Nevertheless, they, the elect, made through the temptations of Satan and the world, the prevalency of corruption reigning in them, and the neglect of the means of their preservation, fall into grievous sin, for a time continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve his Holy Spirit, come to be deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts, have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded, hurt and scandalize others, and bring temporal judgment upon themselves. Now, if you're like me sometimes, when I read Shakespeare, I don't always understand it. When I read Westminster Confession of Fate, sometimes I feel like I'm reading Shakespeare uh, with a theological point of view. So sometimes it's hard to grasp exactly what it said here. But a few words, neglect of the means of their preservation. That means that um, as a believer, there are times when we do not partake of what the Lord has placed in our path that we can grow in, whether it's not coming to a church, right? There are, well, I know many people claim to be believers that don't go to a church. Well, how do you do that? That is the means of your preservation. These are your fellow warriors, Ephesians 6. These are the same people that you should be bonding with, but they're neglecting it. Or reading God's Word. It, it is hard to willfully sin day in and day out when you're spending time in God's Word day in and day out. It is similarly hard to willfully, purposefully transgress when you're praying to the Lord morning, noon, and night. Those, those things are somewhat contradictory. So those are, as the Westminster Confession of Faith tells us, neglect of the means of their preservation. Those are means of our preservation. Fall into grievous sins, just like we're seeing with the prodigal here. And for a time, that's key. For a time. Not for forever, not for eternity. For a time. For a time. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. So there are times, as the Westminster Confession of Faith tells us, and as Scripture abundantly tells us, there are times when believers, when we still sin. Amen? There are times when we still sin grievously and we harden our hearts, as Scripture and Confession of Faith tells us, when we harden our heart to the will of the Lord. There's no doubt about it. And what is it? And those words of grieve His Holy Spirit. If we love the Lord, as we claim to do, and we know He loves us, the idea of grieving the Holy Spirit through our actions or failure to act, that should bring us pause. Let's look at, to elaborate further on this one, when we're talking about perseverance of the saints, let's think of Peter and Judas. Two beautiful examples from Scripture, right? What do they have in common? They have many things in common, right? They were both disciples. Speaking of that, before I get there, all right, of the 12 disciples, how many had the same name? I asked my kids this and quiz them. Two sets of two. Ah, there were two James. What was the other name there were two of? There were two Judas. Judas was an extremely popular name at that day and time. Right? By the way, who, who here knows a Judas today? No one? Wait a minute. That was such a cool popular name back in the first century, right? What's that? Yeah. It is like name your kid. Right? There are probably a couple of Adolfs, but I've never met a Judas. I've never met a Judas. And yet, I know a lot of Peters, right? Does anyone here know a Peter? Yeah. 
I knew a lot of Simons. I know a lot of these other names. I am named James, right? So my son is James. My dad is James. There's a lot of these names that stuck around. But the difference between why we remember with holding up someone and then fearing to the point where nobody even names their child that anymore is key, right? Why is that? Because both these men rejected Christ, did they not? Let's look. Um, consider Peter, Matthew 26, 70, 72, and 74. Oh, let me see this three times. Does anyone know what I'm referring to there? Yeah, exactly. Before the, before the cock crow or rooster crowed. Yes, he rejected Christ three times after he had just said that I will surely die with you. I mean, what a lie. And I say that because I think I'd say the same. And I wouldn't doubt that I would have acted the same. Peter denied with an oath and swore and cursed. He says, I swear I do not know the man. Wow, that's hard. Denied and cursed. And rather than acknowledge, he knew Christ. Not to stand with him, that he even knew Christ. Betrayal. And yet we have Peter's name held in high honor. And no one is named Judas today. They, they did essentially the same thing. They really did. The results towards their actions were different. But they did the same thing. What makes the difference in here? Hmm. Election. That's a simple, easy answer. Judas did not... He, did he repent? Did he detest what he had done? I put forth to you that he probably did. It's kind of hard to go out and hang yourself out of, man, I really did a good job. That's not the action you do if you're proud of what you've done. He regretted what he'd done. There's no doubt about it. And he, he felt... He knew what he'd done. He knew he'd sinned. He knew he'd grieved the Holy Spirit. But yet... I'm fairly confident we're not going to see him in heaven, but yet here we have Peter, who is the complete opposite. John 17, 12, as we're reminded of, and let me, I won't get to that later. The high priestly prayer is something we need to end with because I want us to look at the wording specifically. Now with the prodigal, we see the betrayal of a son. He demands his due and leaves without a word of goodbye, even mentioned. When he chose to sin, again, free choice, we need to keep all free will, we need to keep those things in the back of our mind, because that's the world asks us about. That's what other believers ask us about. So he chose to sin. And is this not a betrayal, just like Peter? It is. Just like Judas? It is. Do not all men sin? Well, of course, we've already covered that. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. And yet, the sins of some are washed away. Limited atonement, right? As far as I think you were mentioning earlier, or Terry, limited. And not limited in power or ability, but limited in scope and application. To, um, so we all sin. Now Ephesians 4, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. This verse speaks to us towards our question in weeks past. God hates a sin and loves a sinner. That's a phrase that we hear often. Well, God definitely hates the sin, right? And He will forever love His elect. Just like the confession of faith just, we just read that Whitney read for us. It, he loves His people, and we are His people, but it still grieves Him and grieves the Spirit when we sin. That's something for us to ever be mindful of. So let's hit the next section, Luke 15, 17-24. When He came to Himself, He said, How many of My Father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and I will ask him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your sin. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your sin, your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on, in his, on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. This is a familiar story, right? Let's not let the familiarness of it miss the point that we're seeing Tulip in this. It says, when does the prodigal turn back? Yeah, when he's at the bottom, right? When is repentance often? It's at the bottom. Oh, man, you guys have already taken this class. I love it. We repent when we've been convinced and convicted, right? When we know what, what we are and who we are, then we repent, those who are chosen by God. So with repentance, the prodigal's mind is beautiful in that 
he's so much like I would do, right? He's like, I want to come up with something to at least, you know, I acknowledge what I've done wrong to my father. And I'm clearly not worthy of the love that he shared or the kindness or the roof that he placed over my head or the food he placed on my table. I'm not worthy of that. So I'm at least going to go back and say, can you at least hire me as the servant? That's what I would have done, right? I mean, that's a, that's a logical approach because you know he's, the father still cares about the son, but he also knows that he's not worthy. Um, Whitney, can you read that Westminster? Um, they whom, that's the right one. Yep. They whom God hath accepted in his beloved, effectually called, and sanctified by his spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. Now that is abundantly clear when we're looking at TULIP. But if we don't necessarily believe in TULIP, then what do we look at for it? Notice that just as the confession points out, we stray away as did the prodigal. Yet the love of the Father remains. He didn't, he didn't love the Father at this point, did he? If he did, he wouldn't have left, right? But did he know the Father loved him? Abundantly clear, right? He absolutely knew the Father still loved him, even though he had ran, as it says, to a far country. By the way, when you think of sin... Sin is something that always associated with a far country, right? I think also, I, I love Pilgrim's Progress and the illustrations back from that are just beautiful. Anyway, so um, yes, the, yet the love of the Father remained. The effectual call, the bonds of love, that is what the effectual call is. It's the bonds of love of God for us. Not for us, for, the, for God, but for God's love of us. The Father remained. And although apart from some of the fruits of the bond, which is His actions, the kindness, the protection, the love, the sustaining, um, the sustaining effect of God's love for us. That's like we read in the last Westminster Confession section. When we neglect the means of grace, when we neglect the means of our own perseverance, there is a price to pay. But he returns to the fold. The prodigal remembers that his father's table is never without provision. That's beautiful, right? Never without provision. He provides for the material and the physical needs, both in this illustration through the uh, parable, but also through Scripture, Matthew 6, 27 through 29. Among others, tell us that we are not to be anxious, and as God provides, further we can see Israel's full 40 years in the desert, for instance, all the different things here. Let's say, what does the Scripture actually say? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. That's the material provision than the spiritual. 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he also provides a way of escape that we may be able to endure it. He provides for the physical and the spiritual on our behalf, on behalf of his children. Now, there's a number of verses we can touch on here that is often put forward for perseverance of the saints. I've got those listed here, like Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. It's kind of hard to overlook that, right? If you believe Scripture and you believe this verse, then how do you not, how do you not believe perseverance of the saint, saints? Jeremiah 31.3, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. That's more towards irresistible grace. It's like we saw when we started off talking about Saul, Paul, on the road to Damascus, and how he's kicking against the goads, but yet, as soon as he's presented in, and put forward here with Christ appearing in front of him like a bolt of lightning, he immediately changes. So he is irresistibly drawn. 1 Peter 1, 4-9, To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation. I won't even read the rest of that. That's, a, that's enough to read. Guarded for salvation. If that's not perseverance of the saints, I'm not sure what would be. These verses speak to an inheritance. Remember the prodigal's original request for his inheritance. Trials and grief, purification, and a glorious reunion for what we see in the prodigal. Romans 8, 33-39, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Again, another verse we have. And then uh, 2 Timothy 1, 12-14, He is able to guard us until that day and we skip ahead. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to us. Repeated verses that there's no other really way to understand them, right? If Scripture is Scripture, if it's by the Word of God, if it is what it proclaims to be, then it has to be true. If it is true, how is there any other way to understand these very verses 
other than perseverance of the saints, to understand the concept that just like we are fallen in our sin, we do believe that God chooses us and chose us before the beginning of time. We do believe that the limited atonement, the cross of Christ, paid the penalty for all our sins in our being all those who are chosen by Him. We do believe that He draws us into Him through the work of the Holy Spirit to our salvation through His action. And we do believe that we are, by that same Spirit and by that same action, able to persevere until the end and then for redemption and for our lives and our resurrection. That's what TULIP represents. These verses can't really be understood any other way. But back to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Can you read that next section? This perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the immutability of the decree of election, flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father, upon the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ, the abiding of the Spirit and of the seed of God within them, in the nature of the covenant of grace, from all which ariseth also the certainty and infallibility thereof. All right, so let's look a little bit more at these words. Just like we started off talking about and asking the questions, which what does T-U-I-L represent, and how, is we, how do we see that from our own spiritual point of view? The perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but we saw that the prodigal used his free will in choosing sin, right? So says, okay, so he chose to sin. And did he not choose to then return? But why was he returning? He wasn't returning out of love, was he? He was returning out of the condition in which he found himself. He had hit rock bottom and was looking for, for a, someone, a way to sustain himself another day. However, but upon the immutability of the decrees of, of election, I love that they put election here, flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God. Okay, it, it's a, is it a two-way street? No. Flowing in one direction only. It flows from the, uh, what did it say? the unchangeable love of God the Father, just like with the prodigal. Who loves who first? There is no doubt about it, right? The prodigal has, in his words of, I essentially wish you were dead, so give me what I am due. He's telling the father his lack of love for him. If it's not obvious before, if it's not obvious after, it is obvious in those words that he has no love for his father. But it's also equally obvious that the father loves his son to the point of giving him anything that, anything that he has. He would give up himself for his son. Please. And, uh, you're talking about the perseverance of the saints. Yes, sir. And I'm sure you're familiar with Hebrews chapter 6, where it says, For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they then fall away, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm. Okay. You got a question from that? Yeah. I, mean, I don't. This states right here um, about people falling away. Yes, it does. And it is impossible to get them back to repentance. So that's Hebrews 11, right? Yeah. Okay. 11 verse, verse Hebrews 6 uh, 11. Oh, wait a minute, that's not Hebrews 6 11. What is it? 6. Hebrews 6. Okay. Verse 4. All right. Well, I, I, I'm just being. You're being, uh, you're being problematic here at the devil's advocate. Always good to be the devil's advocate in Sunday school. Um, that first sentence, can you read it again for me? Sure. Because I think that actually answers what we're talking about. For it is impossible to restore again. And we, if we're talking about the perseverance. Mm -hmm. Believer will Absolutely. persevere. Here's a person. It is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit. That's perfect. And have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they then fall away. Okay, you got it. That's one part I wanted to say. So let's apply that to the prodigal, right? Did the prodigal taste of the father's food? Yes, right? Did he, did he taste every day of his life? He did. He lived a good life. He tasted the father's table every day of his life, right? So that applies. Now the part we said, um, let me see. Can I? Fell away. 
No, there's actually a key point. Let me see. Enlightened. Let's see. Therefore, let us... Wait a minute. I lost you. Verse, chapter 6, okay. verse 3, 4. Okay. Impossible to restore again repentance those who have once been enlightened. Okay, he did the second part. He tasted from the fo food of the Father, no doubt about it. But was he enlightened? Because that's the first thing it mentions here. It says, for it, what's that? Right. All right, gotcha. For it is impossible to restore again to him, to repentance, those who have, first off, had he repented before? No, no, absolutely not. For those who have been enlightened, if he had not repented, and he ha he clearly had not been enlightened, right? If he's not been enlightened, then that verse doesn't really apply to him. Because, by the way, are there people that sit in pews every day, and most of the churches probably across our country, and hear true gospel preached, but yet don't believe? But does that mean that they'll never believe? But does that mean that they'll never believe? Because that's to interpret it this in the, in the way that they're... If someone has heard the gospel and turns their back on it, or even claims to believe it and then walks away from it, that would be misinterpretation of this verse because they're not truly enlightened. Exactly. Now, just as we read, Whitney read in the Westminster Confession of Faith earlier, let me go back to that because that was better said than I could ever say. No, I, you know, I, I believe in the person. No, I know you do. I know you do. Yeah, you just give me a test. I got you. I'm with you, brother. That's no, right. That, you know, that there is that other argument, and they will bring verses like mm -hmm. this one. They will. But like I would, these. oh, if you're actually saying, if, all right, so I think what you're actually saying is, what about someone who has been in church every Sunday, like a, we'll say a pastor's child, right? There's a pastor's son who heard the gospel preached at home and at church every, all of his life, right? And then when he grows up, then he becomes someone who doesn't, who has zero evidence of faith. And is he then going to be able to come, return back into the into the fold? Is that what you're asking? I think it is. Okay. If he never was enlightened in the first place. But this person was enlightened. Was the prodigal enlightened? The prodigal was not enlightened. He shows no love for the father. Zero. If you're enlightened, you love the father, right? Yes, Whitney? You know, uh, just in, with regard to Hebrews 6, um, one thing that's really helped me understanding that uh, is the parable of the sower. Mm -hmm. If you compare Hebrews yes. 6 with the parable that of the sower, that fades when the sun comes, yeah. There are people who mm -hmm. appear to be yeah. receiving the gospel. There's no doubt. But they don't endure and they don't bear fruit. See, I, I would put forth to you that that very first part that Juan read, they were not enlightened. You can give the appearance of being enlightened. Do we, do we know man's heart? No. We can give the appearance. I think there's many ways to look at this, and that one is you can give the appearance of being enlightened, and you're not enlightened, right? Or you're not enlightened at that point in time. There's another way of you are like you are elect, you are his child, but yet you stray away. That's what concerns me more, because I think of my own kids and my own family, and I have people who've heard the gospel that claim it and accept it, but yet there's a time usually, you know, we'll say like in college age, right? When people stray away, like I know I ran pretty far the other direction, but yet to return to the gospel, what your the verses that are attacked here often are, well, they've already turned their back on the gospel. They're crucifying Christ again. So how can that be? That's often a criticism that we hear from that verse. I put forth you, you're not crucifying Christ again because once elect, always elect. Once saved, always saved. Is there anyone here who believes and who has claimed the cross of Christ, but yet never sins after that? No, we don't have the ability not to sin after we're saved. That's key, right? Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. Did I explain it in a way that kind of makes sense? Because I limped through that. But... I don't disagree. I agree 100% yeah. with what you're saying. But what I'm saying is that there are passages in Scripture that seem to indicate, and you know, Whitney brought this up, uh, with the parable of the seed mm -hmm. or the soil um, and those who hold to a view that doesn't uh, that is contrary to the, the view that we hold mm -hmm. they you know they point to verses like, like this one I mean this is a strong warning in the book of Hebrews mm -hmm. uh, to to people who were vacillating yeah and uh, so 
I would say you're absolutely right. Just like, so, uh, but I agree with what you know what we're saying here. We're just trying to be uh, just, just just to uh, put the other. Out, you know that <laughs> there are other people who have different perspective, and we need to be able to refute their mm -hmm. their arguments. I would say we need a whole class in that. Just like when it, when we started off, and what, if you remember that, one of the questions I asked Frank is, if it's God's choice. Why does it tell us knock and the door be open? Because that's the action of us knocking, right? It says that means we act first. This, that was the whole conversation we had in that argument. But if we believe in the truth of Scripture and it all has to reconcile, we have to find a solution to that. And we have to find it scripturally. There's a strong danger, though, in using one piece of, oh, absolutely. of the Bible to educate us on the whole Bible. Absolutely. Taken out of context, it can say anything someone wants it to say. Yes, we've absolutely. Seen that and we'll continue to see that. That's how flaw and error comes in. Story. Amen. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. And that's um, go ahead. Yeah. Thinking about Judas, if you apply Hebrews six to Judas, mm. he he meets all those things. Like he was in life. Yeah. He tasted. He, he was at the last, last supper with Christ. Yeah. He dipped the bread, so to speak. Right. Yeah. So yeah. All of those things. Jesus, Jesus experienced all those blessings of Hebrews 6. Yeah. And yet his faith was not complete. I love it. Look, like a great example, Judas and Thomas. You got Judas who's here who's dipping and tasting, just as Hebrew says here, tasting of the Lord's table, and yet we know his end. But yet we also have Thomas whose faith was so weak that he didn't believe until he saw the risen Lord in front of him and was told to touch the wounds. So there's different, there's so many beautiful aspects to be seen in Scripture from the people that it presents to us and how they react to the Gospel. Both rejection, such as Judas, both fighting against it, but yet accepting it like Paul saw, or like Peter, accepting it, then rejecting, and then coming back and being forgiven and drawn back in, or like Thomas, who doubts, it, who doubts and clearly had those doubts all along. There's so many beautiful aspects from Scripture that we can partake of. And by Jesus' brother James. Yes. Him, until so after. Him. Absolutely. Isn't it amazing? So grew up with him and tried to get him committed. So. Yes. How hard would that anyway? Yes, Forrest. Going back to the prodigal son, I think there's an important clarification there. It says when he came to himself. Mm -hmm. So God allowed mm -hmm. him to come to the end of himself, which we all have to do. Yeah. He Hit rock bottom. A confession. He said. Yeah. I sinned against heaven and before you. There's yeah. a certain amount of repentance there. He humbled himself totally. So that it is. was a great example here of what was happening in his heart. This is far different than someone who's been, yeah. uh, quote, saved and mm -hmm. sealed and, and everything else and been in church. So drawing us back to the prodigal, thank you for that. As you're seeing here, the proper response to the gospel is repentance. And the proper response to realizing what Christ has done for us is gratitude and self-humbling, right? Because we know that there's nothing we can do to remove our condition. There's nothing we can do. And his repentance and his admission, those don't earn him points, do they? That's not what saves him. I love the Father's response, even after he does that. The Father's response is, oh, since you've repented and said you're sorry, I'll accept you back. What does the Father actually say? Does he even acknowledge that? No! He doesn't even acknowledge his son's words in that aspect because he loves the son. He doesn't, he's not looking for those words. He's looking for the heart to make a difference. And let's just read that next section. Where are we? Do, do, do. Oh, yeah, that older brother. Yeah, 15, 25 through 32. Now, his older son, I probably won't have time to go through this. I'll read it. His older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of his servants and asked, What are these meant? And he said to him, Your brother came home, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered the father, Look, these many years I have served you and never disobeyed you, your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this is your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. There's so much here 
to spend time on for the older brother, but we can't. That's not what we're focused on today. We're talking about perseverance of the saints. We don't have visual evidence from this prodigal uh, of this parable of the older persevering. We don't have that. So we're not focusing on him today. Now the lesson, let's see, what is it? Say, does this speak of why God allows evil to exist for you will and glory? Now to me, that's very important because um, like we're talking to high schoolers who have great questions, lots of questions, uh, more questions than you could probably even listen to. But parts of their questions are, why, there's so many series of questions from an apologetic point of view towards this point, right? Why does God allow sin? And Juan, thank you for pointing out last week, God does not ordain sin. He does not generate sin. He is not the author of sin. All those are not of his making. It is the absence of God that is sin. So why do we have sin? Why couldn't God have just made us so that we don't sin? Wouldn't that have solved the problem? Wouldn't that have been a lot easier for God and for us? That way we wouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit? Aren't those good questions? You ever think about those questions? I put forward that we have that answer here. Consider who, um, here's a, I think it's Matthew 7, 47. He who is forgiven little loves little. What does that really mean, right? It says when the Son returned, his sins weren't even addressed. What he'd done, did the father ask him, what have you done? No, he didn't. Now, I love how the older brother already assumes what the younger brother did. He hasn't even seen him yet. And he says, oh, he's out with prostitutes, squandering it. He doesn't know. He wasn't there. He didn't even ask. He hasn't even met him yet. He's making an assumption here of those sins. But with the younger son, he knows what he's done. Do you think with being forgiven for all he's done makes him more grateful and more understanding of the love of the Father than if he'd done nothing really deserve? Maybe he just lost his money. Maybe he was robbed. Maybe he squandered it. No, it doesn't. The father didn't know that. There's an assumption there. But how, when you think of the verse from Matthew 7, where did I was at? He was forgiven little, loves little. I think the parable of the prodigal actually ties into that too. And it helps us understand why God allows sin. If God wanted robots, he would have made robots, right? If God wanted trees and rocks that didn't sin, he would have made trees and rocks that didn't sin and did not make man, right? So why did he make us? As we answered last week, God made us for his own glory, to enjoy him and love him forever. Ah, love him forever? Rocks and trees don't love? No, they don't. So how do you increase love? Oh, huh, let me see what does scripture say. He was forgiven little, loves little. When we see our own transgressions, when we see what we've done, just think of how um, it is in a family. In a family, we hurt each other all the time, right? You know, through our words, through our... <laughs> oh, I, love how, I love some looks uh, here today between, let's say, daughters and mothers. <laughs> we won't comment on that, but, but we hurt ourselves. We hurt each other. The people we love the most, we often hurt the most, just by our words, our actions, our deeds. But yet, we love them the most. We still love them. And by the way, when we truly forgive our loved ones, when we put it out of our mind and we don't remind it every time they step out of line again, right? Because I think with kids, there's that temptation. You know, just like last time, I forgive you. That's not a forgiveness, right? That's not biblical forgiveness. But when we forgive something and blot it out and we don't remind them of it, we don't remember it. By the way, does God, when he says, you no longer remember sin, does that mean you forgot? No! No, that means he doesn't hold it to our account anymore. And if we're good parents, then we do that with our children too. We don't hold it to their account. We, for, we forgive them and we wash it away. And the proper response to that from a loving child is more love, right? When I've been forgiven a trespass that is grievous to my wife, which happens fairly often, um, when she forgives me in a way that I'm not reminded of it often, that increases my love for her. If we look at that from this prodigal point of view, in the same aspect, it helps me understand why did God make us in the first place so that we could sin? That's a root question, right? If we don't understand that, that's just like one you're saying. There's a question that people ask us. Well, if all he wanted was people who, who uh, didn't sin, why did he make you able to sin in the first place? Why did God introduce sin? I know I'm wording it that way on purpose. Why does God allow sin? Why does God allow evil? All those questions are tied up in one key fundamental. And that's understanding why we're made, how we're made. Did God have a plan? for us in the way that he made us? And the answer to that has to be yes. And to understand that through the prodigal helps me. Lessons from the prodigal. 
Let's see. Let's move on because we are out of time. There's a lot here I still want to cover towards flowing from the prodigal, but I would rather we skip ahead to the high priestly prayer because our purpose here today is understanding the perseverance of the saints. Um, does everyone have uh, John 17 in the printout? Is it underlined? Because I'm not sure if it was or wasn't. Are there some underlines? There is? All right, perfect. All right, this is from John 17, the high priestly prayer. And I know you've read it before, or at least you've heard it said. I know I've read it many times. But when I read it once when in a study, I'm trying to understand Tulip, a few words just stuck out to me. I'm going to start in the second paragraph. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. To the people whom you gave me. Does that mean, like what I was saying earlier, that they chose God? No. You get God gave people to the Son. Yours they were, and you have gave them to me. And they kept your word. Wow. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they kept your word. Hmm. Is that kind of like persevering? It is. That's exactly what it is. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Again, giving. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them. Irresistible grace, right? They have received them. And have come to know in truth that I came from you, and that they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world. Limited atonement, right? I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. Unconditional election, irresistible grace, limited atonement. We see all this in here. Those uh, whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and all yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name. Persevere. Perseverance of the saints. Keep them in your name. Which you have given me, that they may be one, even as, you are, as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name. Again, God perseveres for us. He is, the one, he, is the, he is our ability to persevere because we have Him. As it says, kept in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. Christ guarding us? And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction. And Whitney's not here, but you know, one's Hebrew 6. That's perfect. That the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and, all, and these things I speak to the world. I speak in the world that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of this world, but you keep them from the evil one. That's as good a definition of perseverance of the saints as there is. He doesn't seek for us to be removed from suffering and pain. He doesn't seek to take us out of the world. He seeks to keep us persevering in this world until the end. Let's skip to the next one. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe. And I'm going to stop there. That's us. Those who will believe. In that point in time, in that historical um, element, of, in that instance of Scripture, He is praying to God the Father for us. Those who will believe. That is us. He has foreordained whom He has chosen. But those who believe will believe and persevere to the end. And as it says, that is us who will believe. And again, he repeats in 24, you have given me. I mean, how many times in this one small section of Scripture do we see, particularly Tulip, but perseverance of the saints over and over and over? Did you ever see it in this high priestly prayer? I didn't until I read it this way. But to me, it's once I read it this way, when I'm looking for a truth, that someone else has pointed out to me that's found in Scripture, then I see it everywhere, right? It's kind of like if you've ever bought a car, and you're like, oh, this is a great car. How many of those cars do you see driving around the road everywhere, right? You never noticed them before, but like, oh man, I've got a VW Beetle, because that was my first car. It seemed like half the world had VW Beetles after that, because I saw they're everywhere. Same here, when I'm looking for something in Scripture, I see it everywhere. Was it there before? Yeah, it was there before. Was it veiled from my eyes? Was it my own ignorance and my own sin keeping me from seeing it? Yeah, it really was. And it was men like uh, Calvin, Luther, Augustine, others that pointed out these truths in Scripture that were always there, always there for us to find those hidden treasures. And they pointed them out to a way that we can understand it, and then we look for it, and then we see it ourselves, then we possess it, just like the prodigal. Uh, yeah, I love, um, you never speak where Scripture stops. 
But I still fantasize about knowing what the next part is, right? Did the older brother repent? I don't know. But the younger brother, tell me this. Um, the father was a farmer, right? He held the, the, the harvest. Each year, the next year when the harvest came, who do you think would have been the biggest proponent of going out in the fields and looking for, or going out into the seat, streets and cities and looking for workers to come into the father's field? It would have been the prodigal, right? My father is good. He is loving. He is kind. He is generous. Come and work with him. You'll never have need or want. He will care for you. He will love you. I can see that as the next part, right? Because this would have been the natural reaction. But this is a story. It is. Absolutely. was important to Jesus' message. Absolutely. And we think, so I'm so I'm thankful for it. Yep, absolutely. That's where it stopped. Speaking of stopping, I'm five minutes over. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the parables that you give us. They are illustrations for us, um, or I'll say for me, a, a simple mind to understand a picture, just like we talked about last week with the with our image of what tulip can be seen in a, in a child's game. Lord, your message is simple. We are sinners in need of a Savior. And Lord, there is only way that one way that we can be saved under one name. Lord, we thank you for that simple message. But Lord, we also thank you for the depths that can be plumbed so that we can understand so much of who you are in your word. And in this life, we will never reach the end of understanding your word. And thank you for it, Lord. In the name we pray. Amen.